April 2020 to, um, well, right up to today. And it's about how I, as a relative beginner, learned to see more animals and plants and try to identify them. So what I hope to do is share some very practical hints to inspire other beginners to get out and meet animals and plants and fungi, get to know them and love them, perhaps even the wasps, because all living things need our love at the moment in these very difficult times. So I'm going to focus on a few highlights only. This isn't going to be a comprehensive natural history of the Horniman Nature Trail. Um, and those tree fans amongst you, and I'm sure we're all tree fans, um, I'm afraid there isn't much specifically about trees, um, but this is about the woodland habitat and the um, species it supports. So the title, of course, um, of this talk is, is a reference to Edith Holden's Nature Diary of 1906, the country diary of an Edwardian lady. And I'm sure some of us will have sort of copies of this uh, tucked away in our bookcases. It was, it, it was an extremely popular book um, 20 or so years ago. And Edith Holden, in many ways, um, exemplifies some of the qualities I want to talk about today. She was someone who was a very uh, quiet person, a very um, reserved person who loved um, painting and observing closely the natural world and produced these very beautiful pictures, which were never meant for publication. They were always meant for her own enjoyment and for the teaching of the children um, sh she used to teach. And she has a rather sad end to her life. At the age of 49, she died um, in London near Kew, and she fell into the River Thames while trying to pick chestnut buds, apparently. So I suppose one could say that she died doing the things, uh, doing the thing that she loved, which was being um, in the natural world. So this is a tribute, really, this talk a tribute to Edith Holden and all the people like her who are quietly getting on, observing nature and enjoying it in their own quiet way. So there, it is not the only classic nature diary, though, Edith Holden's, because 70 years later, there was another one, which is, of course, my classic nature diary of 1976. And you will see there on the left the rather beautiful front cover decorated with graffiti, which has now lost any meaning it might once have had. Uh, the initials ATP, I have no idea what that stands for. And you'll see there, beware of the dog in Latin, and French for some reason. Uh, but look at those wonderful illustrations, and I'm sure you'll agree they are the equal of Edith Holden's. That Canada goose, it looks like it's about to fly off the page, doesn't it? Absolutely beautiful. And here we're back now to Edith Holden. This is her salutation to spring from 1906. Um, Come forth ye blossoms over hill and lea, a breath of sweetness wantons with the sea. And mid the smiles and tears of tender spring on dripping boughs, I hear the throstle sing. And there's a lot more where that came from. But there is also um, another nature diary which has similarly beautiful prose. Um, this is my nature diary from spring 1976. April the 17th, went to Dartmoor and saw a buzzard in air. May the 5th, starling seen feeding young under eaves of Mr. Penn's house. June the 2nd, on the way back from library, I noticed about four house martins under Mr. Penn's eaves. June the 4th, on way back from taking Mrs. Evans' cat to the cattery, we saw a male yellowhammer in a hedge. And there's some rather lovely ducks there on the right. Uh, so you want more, you want more, you will get more. So I'm sure you want to know what else was found under Mr. Penn's eaves. Well, here we go, October 1976. On this day, I walked up the garden and on an apple tree, I noticed a great spotted woodpecker drumming on the trunk. The hole that it made is about three quarters of an inch deep. And there you will see a very neat diagram of the trees and the direction of the woodpecker's flight. And it carefully notes woodpecker sighted here, flew away into Mr. Penn's garden. So there we are. <laughs> so. I was a sort of bird watcher, as you'll see. Uh, my entries were not as detailed and rigorous as Edith Holden's, but I was very keen on birds at a young age. But of course, adult life takes over and you don't get out as much as you want to. Um, and um, then sometimes it takes a change in your life to rediscover those things you loved as a child. So 44 years later, in April 2020, 
the UK um, is, hang on, let's, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. So 44 years later in April, 2020, the UK is connecting with nature and all of us need a bit of uh, peace and that in the natural world but the problem is things get very busy don't they in the parks so that on the left that's what Dulwich Park looked like in uh, last spring and on the right that's what my local nature reserve looked like at Sydenham Hill Woods absolutely full of dogs everyone in London I, suppose, I think it's the same everywhere in the country seemed to um, buy dogs or get dogs uh, during lockdown and parade them around Sydenham Hill Woods. So it was not necessarily the best place to connect with nature. So five minutes walk from where I live is a place called the Horniman Museum. Uh, and there it is on the, on the left, um, a very um, interesting museum with fascinating things inside and beautiful um, formal and semi-formal gardens. But we're not here really to talk about that. We're here to talk about the place on the right, which is the Horniman Nature Trail. So that on the left is um, a busy main road, um, the, 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 um, which runs down to Forest Hill. And on the left, you'll see the trees, which are the nature trail poking out. Um, and on the right there, that's my daughter, who was my companion for many of these uh, walks, which we're gonna talk about. And so just by that litter bin you can see on the left, there's a flight of little steps uh, up to a little path called the Night Walk, which is a cut through. Um, and then if you turn left again, you go up some more steps onto the trail itself. So it's a hidden little place, which is what I like about it. So here you'll see, um, uh, this is taken from the board of the Nature Trail. And you'll see that the, the Nature Trail is basically a long, thin trail because it is formed from a disused railway line. So it's only 100 yards across or so at its maximum, if that. Um, and it is completely surrounded by houses. That green there is misleading. The dark green are the, is the Horniman Gardens, but the light green is all residential houses. So residential areas and houses back right onto the, onto the nature trail. Um, so let's go for a walk along the trail. So the trail starts off on a, on a slight embankment. So you already heard that you have to walk up a few steps to get up, get up to it. Um, so there's a lovely embankment which gives you gorgeous views over London on, on, on your left. And there, uh, and on the right there, the right hand slide, you'll see the view over to Dawson's Heights, which is um, a very uh, dramatic um, piece of architecture by Kate McIntosh, quite a famous uh, piece of architecture. Um, and, you'll get these lovely views and glimpses of, of, of buildings and, and, and London as, as you walk along the trail. And then towards the end of the trail, it flattens out and becomes a bit of a cutting. And you'll see there, there's the pond, um, taken on a rather dingy day in the winter, and the meadow, a small meadow, which is right at the end of the trail, um, which is which very badly trampled, um, but it's now, um, pleased to say, recovering well. So a little bit now about the history of the trail, just to get things in context before we meet some of the wildlife. So the land originally was owned by Dulwich College. In 1863, the vegetation was cleared and a railway line was built, uh, running from Peckham to Crystal Palace to serve the new Crystal Palace. And Dulwich College were rather cross with the railway company because they said, you've chopped down too many trees. And so they had to replant it. So the railway company replanted uh, some horse chestnut, poplar, lime, and also there was natural spread of, um, of birch, hawthorn and sycamore. And then when the railway line closed down in 1954, the land was sold to the council and became a nature trail. And in 1973, many of you or some of you, uh, uh, some of the older ones amongst us will remember 1973, um, planted a tree in 73, and indeed, there was a little celebration of the trail and they planted um, various um, new trees, white beam, beech, hornbeam and oak to commemorate that, um, that event. Um, in 1986, the trail became under the ownership of the Horniman Museum and it was then more actively managed. A meadow was sown, which I've just shown you in 1988, and the pond and marshy area were created a bit later. And just want to say a quick thanks to Dennis Vickers, who's an ecologist who did a survey of the trail 
uh, much of that history comes from his report. The habitat now is what ecologists would describe as a semi-mature secondary woodland. So you've got some of those original old oak trees, the very old ones. You've also got some of the trees that the railway company planted, and you've also got trees that have naturally colonized the area. So you've got quite a mixture um, of interesting um, trees there. You've got ground cover of bramble, nettle, ivy and cow parsley, very similar to kind of lowland um, woodland that you'll see across uh, South England. Um, but because it's adjacent to gardens, you've got a lot of garden escapes, uh, things like Russian vine, winter heliotrope, variegated ivy, um, various honeysuckles and, and so on. So you've got quite an interesting mixture of the old and the new and the natural and the garden escape. So around the time um, that I started doing these walks, I guess around sort of must have been in the sort of middle or beginning of May, um, I was at work. Um, and um, so I work in the NHS, so we were <laughs> expected to go in. Um, but we were sitting in, a, in quite a big room, uh, having a sort of short meeting, all socially distanced, wearing our masks, and the windows were wide open to allow the air to come in. And then while there was the usual sort of uh, messing about with trying to get the computer to work, as there always is, uh, <laughs> um, I heard a swift, and it was the first swift I'd heard of the season, and it was always, it's always a very life-affirming, exciting sound for me, the swift. It brings back so many memories of, of, of uh, childhood summers and and, and um, the excitement of the swift arriving is always a great event. So I just made a comment, oh, I think I heard a swift. And the, there was a kind of silence in the room and then somebody said, what's a swift? And then I realized really um, that, well, maybe I shouldn't assume that people know what swifts are because if I'm honest, if I was honest with myself, I may have known what a swift was because I was you know, a bit of a bird watcher, but my knowledge of animals and plants other than birds was probably pretty dismal. Um, and here's a little quote from Peter Marin, who's a, a, a nature writer um, who wrote a book, Chasing the Ghost, about the rare flowers of, of Britain. And he says this, talking about the loss of knowledge of names of wildflowers in this country. Some say that names don't matter, that it is much more important that we care but imagine someone professing to love football, but not knowing the rules of the game or the names of the players or anything about it, really. And I think that's what um, I realised that I would I would say I would have said that I, I loved nature. I love natural history. But there were many, many animals, plants, fungi, slime molds that I didn't even know the name of. And so there was a bit of a mismatch there in um, my belief that I love nature and the reality of how much did I really know? about it. So I had a little plan. I decided this wasn't good enough um, and I'd try and rectify this. And I thought that I could combine this with my daily kind of lockdown walks up this little nature trail um, and try and identify as many of the living things who lived on the trail as I could. And I asked the Horneman if they'd be interested in the results. And they sent me these rather sort of daunting spreadsheets to uh, complete, which I agreed to do every month. Um, but at the start, it was going to be hard because at that time, I didn't even know what this flower was. Um, I'm sure many of you do. Um, and it is a lesser celandine, a very common in early spring on the edges of paths and woodland. And it's not a buttercup because it has these very um, characteristic kind of heart shaped leaves. Um, and it, but it was in the buttercup family. It's now been taken away from the buttercup family. So similar to a buttercup, but not a buttercup, the, less, the lesser celandine, the early spring uh, yellow flower. So this is my first survey in April 2020. So that's not a shopping list on the left, although it might look like one. Four cans of special brew and a pot noodle. Does it say? No, it doesn't say that. This is a list of the, um, the, the all the animals that I saw. Um, this isn't actually the original um, list. This is a list from um, June last year, um, but the original list looked much the same. So basically, I went out with a clipboard and a bit of paper and a pencil, slowly walked the length of the trail one sort of wet March afternoon um, and wrote down the name of any living thing I, I knew. Um, I don't mean people, <laughs> I mean, um, you know, animals, plants, fungi. 
Um, and what this confirmed is that I was pretty good at identifying birds. So I was pretty confident by the end of it that I had identified every bird that I'd seen or heard, including the ones flying over. But as far as anything else went, I was pretty poor. Even the trees, I was struggling. Um, so why does identifying plants and animals seem so difficult? Well, I think those of us who are members of kind of um, natural history groups like the, and charities like the RSBB will be sent these magazines and emails. And in them, there's always some smart Alec who has identified you know, 700 species in their back garden or 500 species of moth in a tiny little park somewhere. And it kind of puts you off because they tell you this and say, isn't this wonderful? Isn't this person great? But what they don't tell you is how that person started and how to do it as a beginner. And you end up just feeling, well, there's so many of these animals. I can't possibly learn them all. Um, it's difficult enough with the, you know, the few hundred birds, let alone all these thousands of species. Where do you start? And that where do you start is kind of missing in a lot of the natural history literature and the natural history popular press uh, and websites. And there is, sure, a lot to learn. There are 70,000 species in the UK, according to the London Natural History Museum, and about half of those, just under half, are insects. So something approaching 30,000 species of insects. So that is a lot of insects, isn't it? Um, there are things that you see all the time, aren't they like honeybees? And you know they're not honeybees, but what are they? There's lots of stripy little things hovering around, and then there's these clouds and clouds of tiny little dark flies or mosquitoes flying about and they won't stay still and you can't see them and you just think where do I start with all this and even some quite big common animals are hard to tell apart when you start it's hard to differentiate a wasp and a hoverfly it's hard to differentiate a large white and a small white and these are big common animals that you really feel you should get to grips with and the other question is, well, where do you stop? This is like an infinite, <laughs> infinite thing, isn't it? So do you start scraping the green mold off fences and looking at, looking at that under the microscope? What about bacteria? Well, are they animals? Why shouldn't we look at those? Are they living things? Viruses? Where do you stop? So it all gets a bit daunting and you can feel a bit overwhelmed. So these are kind of the rules that I kind of developed as I went along in the first few weeks of doing this. First, I decided that to begin with, I was just going to ignore stuff like grass and lichen and tiny, tiny little things that I could barely see and green mold and stuff like that was just going to be ignored at the moment. And as I hadn't got a functioning electron microscope, I felt the viruses could probably wait just for the moment. So I started with a few groups that I felt were a reasonable place to start the trees partly because they stay still and you can come back. And even if you haven't a clue what a tree is, you can, you can come back the next day with your book and have another look. Butterflies, because I kind of knew some of those. And bumblebees, because I just read a book about them and I rather like bumblebees. And flowers. So I thought with flowers, I could do a few at a time. And I was doing this online flower course at the time, so Identity Plant, which is a beginner's flower course run by the FS Field Studies Council and British, uh, um, sorry, uh, Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. Um, so quite a complicated course, but I thought this is a way perhaps to get to know the flowers. So next, so the next thing about this, once you've set some boundaries and decided what groups you're gonna look at is you need to agree with yourself that you're gonna have fun because this is should be fun. If you're not getting pleasure, from being in the natural world and observing wildlife, well, you're doing it wrong. And everybody's got their own interests. Everybody wants to do things their own way. So do it your own way and enjoy it. So what I did, and I'm not saying this is what everyone else should do, but I joined in with some beginner's surveys. So plant life has this thing called the Great Spring Wildflower Hunt. And if you've got a smartphone, there's this little app and you can go along ticking off the flowers that you see and they stick to the common ones and it's quite satisfying and the data goes to a national database and you feel like you're doing something useful uh, whether you are or not <laughs> i don't know but it kind of connects you to other people and it's a good way of learning common wildflowers there are lots of others which i won't go through now but what i can talk about um, later if people want the second thing is that if i couldn't find 
the animal or plant I was looking at easily in the book or online. I just thought, look, I'm not going to worry about this. I'll come back to it another day. Let's move on. And in the words of Peter Marin, when you have to get the microscope out to identify it, that's when I start to lose interest. And I couldn't agree more. This is supposed to be fun. We're not, um, you know, um, making this a chore. This should be fun. If you like getting the microscope out, well, <laughs> you know, good for you. Get on with it. But if you don't, keep it simple. Um, so my third ground rules are more to do with a kind of attitude. And I suppose one thing I noticed um, or have noticed for a long time is that the way that people use uh, quiet spaces and nature reserves sometimes isn't qu isn't quite what I would like them to do. And I know that sounds a bit selfish, but I also think sometimes people don't show appropriate respect for the wildlife that's in nature reserves. Dorset Wildlife Trust say nature reserves are places for people to enjoy seeing wildlife and for nature to find a safe haven. So that's absolutely it, isn't it? So nature reserves are not places to play football or have a fight or ride your bike up and down and shouts or have a dog uh, race or something. It doesn't say that. It's about you go there to either enjoy nature or and the primary purpose is for the, for the natural world itself, the animals, plants and um, fungi who actually are really finding it hard in our society to actually uh, have a, have a finger hold in the world. So my nature trail code, if you like, is leave things where they are. Um, we live in the middle of you know, a big city. There aren't enough flowers for everybody to pick and put in their vase. Um, there aren't enough fungi for everybody to um, uh, you know, grub up and uh, eat. Um, we need to leave them where they are in this tiny little nature trail. I don't particularly like bashing the foliage to find insects. I think that that's maybe justified if you're doing a proper survey uh, with scientific interest, but really just treat the foliage with respect. There's no need to bash it. There's plenty of insects you can see just looking. Um, stick to the path. One thing I've learned um, is the terrible detrimental um, action of, of trampling and walking on um, off the path. I think that, again, it's fine if one person does it every day, but when you've got hundreds and hundreds of people using the wood, trampling, um, you know, it de-aerates the soil, it crushes them, a fungal mycelium, and it really interferes with the health of trees, it disturbs birds. There's so many reasons why in a small urban nature trail, you should stick to the path. Yeah, sure, if you've got 5,000 hectares of you know, wilderness run where you want, but this isn't this isn't that. This is a small nature trail, and talk quietly. The amount of people who <laughs> go along the nature trail uh, shouting their head off about um, nothing really. Um, just be quiet. You're in a nature reserve. The black cap song is far more interesting than um, you know some actor from Fleabag or whatever it is that people are, are going on about. Next thing is if you need to kill something to identify it, perhaps find something else to identify. Um, if you think about it, you know, if I saw someone who I thought was my friend on the other side of the road, I wouldn't get out a machine gun and mow them down and, uh, uh, oh, oh yeah, it was my friend. Uh, I would, you don't do that, do you? There is no need to kill, and there really isn't. And, and again, if you are an ecologist doing a really important survey, Yes, maybe it's justified to, to, to kill a few insects, but if you're an amateur uh, and you really love wildlife, why would you kill things? Just leave them alone. And last but not least, leave the pets at home. <laughs> so this is Eric on the left, and I'm sure he's gonna disturb me in a minute. He's, he's, quite, <laughs> he's quite disturbingly quiet at the moment. So he would love to be on the nature trail and catching a few rats and uh, uh, killing a few black cats, but, we don't let him, we, we only let him out in the garden, uh, closely supervised at the moment anyway. And we try to, we realize that actually cats and dogs are very detrimental to wildlife if they're not well behaved and if they run loose. Um, so I think that on a nature reserve particularly, um, pets need to be kept under control. Um, and I'm sad to say that even in the Horniman, I see, you know, several dogs at once running through the undergrowth, barking, disturbing the birds. And it really uh, does kind of sadden me really. So just 
treat living things gently is the is the message. Sorry if that sounds like a bit of a lecture, but <laughs> um, um, and I just quote this is a book that um, Martha, my daughter, um, hi, uh, was given by by her grandparents, and and there's a lovely quote in this from 1923, so it's nearly a hundred years ago. We may beat the resting insects from the bushes, but we learn more when we found them singly at rest. We remember then their attitude, their wonderful blending with their surroundings, their food plant and the situation on leaf, trunk or branch, which they generally affect. So even a hundred years ago, at the height of the foliage bashing, butterfly killing era and bird nesting era, there were some people who wanted a more reflective, quieter, a gentler approach in, in, in our relationship with nature. So uh, let's learn from T.A. Coward uh, and just treat things gently. So, um, so what, here's some basic things that I learned and I apologize if this is really very basic, but um, so when you see people walking through a nature trail or a nature reserve, you'll see people, they're, they're just rushing they've got their headphones in there. And I was, I was there this afternoon and, you know, the people I saw, they had their earphones in, they were running or they were briskly walking, you know, trying to get their pulse rate up or whatever. That's fine, but you're not going to see anything like that. You need to take your time and be really slow. And most importantly, you need to stay still, stand still for a few minutes in three or four places. Um, and it's important to choose your places. Insects like the sun, so choose a little sunny spot, um, sometimes a little patch of sunlight after it's been raining. It's amazing the insects that come, um, uh, uh, how, the, how the ground comes alive and the insects settle on that little patch of sunlight. And staying there um, for a few minutes is can be sort of magical, really, the things that you see. Um, the timing of your visits is crucial. So uh, people are creatures of habit, just like animals. and. If you go on Sunday afternoon on a bank holiday when it's sunny, you, you won't see anything apart from lots of people. So choose your time early in the morning on a weekday if you can, um, or the best time is after it's been raining. So when it was raining this afternoon, I said, when the rain stops, I'm immediately going to go up to the nature trail. And when after it's been raining, nobody's there. Um, people, Londoners particularly, seem to hate the rain. They won't go out in the rain. So you'll have it all to yourself. So during the rain or immediately after the rain, um, it's 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 wonderful. It's so quiet, um, and uh, you know you've got you've got you can have the place to yourself. Um, and the other thing, which you know, again, is was always drilled into me when I was reading these uh, these books about natural history when I was younger is draw and write notes as well as taking photos because that way it really makes you look. And on the left, you'll see my little scribbles of bumblebees that I saw uh, back in May last year. Um, and I think the top one is a buff, no, oh, no, I think the top one is an early bumblebee and the bottom one is a buff tailed. But those are my genuine scribbles that I made at the time when I was looking at the bees and I was able to go home and look at the book and work out what the bees were. So take a little notebook and draw and write notes. It makes you look carefully, um, but do take photos as well. I mean, we take, uh, Martha and I took loads and loads of photos of all sorts of things, and that's really helpful. So let's meet some of the things uh, that we found. Flowers. So when I did my uh, identiplant course, um, they were really obsessed with the use of what's called botanical keys. Um, so here is one of the botanical keys, the wildflower key. Um, and a key is a set of choices which, if answered correctly, will lead you to the right plants. But look at some of the choices you're asked to uh, make. Flowers with the petals joined, or at least their bases, often forming a corollary tube, which is usually lobed. Yes or no? Carpels and styles, both free and separate from one another, or almost so, yes or no. So I don't know about you, but I find this sort of writing kind of exasperating. I don't even know what those sentences, well, I certainly didn't. And I've had problems now really understanding what exactly those things mean. And when you're you know, looking at this book with its tiny grayish print through kind of smeared glasses with your uh, mask on and looking at a hand lens, uh, uh, leaning over, uh, looking at some flower, 
this and this book never doesn't stay open you put it open on the ground it it bangs shut in a really irritating way so the whole experience of using keys for me is uh, not good and my answer to those questions is either i haven't a clue or i really cannot be bothered to find that out so rose and riley o'reilly who wrote this book say keying out is fun uh, i say keying out is not fun uh, certainly not for beginners so then i found this book so this book simon harrop's wild flowers and this is what simon harrop says in his introduction most textbooks use keys which use a lot of technical terms and require fine judgments to answer the questions correctly, which in turn demands a great deal of experience. It has been said that keys work best when you already know the answer, and that's his italics. I've chosen not to use keys and hope the many photographs in this guide will do the job as well, if not better. And for a beginner, I completely agree. This, this book, I identified dozens more wildflowers using this book than I ever did using the keys. Um, and I think as a beginner, um, if you love keys and you love that very methodical algorithmic approach, I'm not trying to put you off at all. Clearly, um, the botanists, many botanists love it. But as a beginner, I find photographs are the best way for me. So uh, don't be put off by the people who say you have to use keys. You really don't have to use keys. Photographs are just as good when you're starting off. Um, so that's um, that's my view. And Harrop isn't the only guide. There are many other photographic guides, but I, I think Harrop's a fantastic book. I really enjoy it. So here's some few other quick ID tips, how to identify flowers. There's Martha's picture of the green alkanet there, which is a common flower along the trail. So take the book to the flower, not the flower to the book. We've already said that. Don't pick things if you can avoid it. Take the book along with you in your rucksack. That's the way. Um, and get to know a few common ones. So choose a little area, which could even be the pavement outside your house or your walk to work and get to know 10, 20 common flowers. Because once you know the common ones, it's, it's easier then to know when you've seen a rarer one and look it up. And a hand lens is great for seeing the beauty and the detail of these flowers. Here's a couple of flowers. I need to speed up a bit actually, so I'll whiz through these. Um, that I saw on the trail. So the ivy broom rape, rape is a wonderful um, flower and you'll notice there it's kind of browny purple. It's got no um, chlorophyll in it because it is a parasite and it attaches to the ivy roots through a node called a rape. Um, so then a rape is an old word for a turnip apparently. So there's this node which sucks out all the goodness including the sugars from the ivy roots. Um, and so it's a wonderful, mysterious kind of flower which peers up through the ivy. Uh, and Martha found the first one of these and we were so excited when we found it. And then we realized there's actually lots of them along the trail. And it's relatively, um, well, it's not rare, but it's not that common either. So it was a delight to see it on the, on the trail. And this is an introduction, the winter heliotrope, which some people say is an invasive species and perhaps it is but i really really like it what look at those flowers these flower in the middle of winter in december and january this gorgeous sort of cherry vanilla strange exotic scent um and it reproduces mainly asexually through these roots and interestingly nearly all the plants in um, britain are male plants and there's only been one little patch of female plants found in Sussex. Um, so all the plants in, in Britain, nearly all of them, are reproducing asexually through this sort of rooting and spreading. So an interesting fact for you there, <laughs> possibly. Insects. So I've already said about insects, there are thousands of them. And they, the thing I found out the other day is there's over 7,000 species of wasps. <laughs> That's just amazing, isn't it? And some of them are tiny. So one of the smallest wasps is 0.14 millimeters um, uh, long. So good luck with finding that one. Um, so I'm going to just keep this uh, simple and say, look, there are loads of insects, but maybe one needs to start somewhere. And I start by saying, is is it a bee, a fly, or a wasp? I'm going to ignore those tiny little things and odd looking things. We're just going to concentrate on the uh, the, 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 the things that look like bees and flies and wasps. So look at that bee on the left. This is an ashy mining bee. Um, and I have seen them just 20 yards from the nature trails. So I'm not quite in the nature trail, which is slightly disappointing, but they are beautiful um, uh, mining bees, solitary bees. Um, but if you look at the bee there, you notice that 
it's furry furry with long antennae and eyes on the side of its head whereas the fly and that there is an epistrophe elegans hoverfly quite common along the trail and a lovely sort of brassy metallic look to it um but the, the fly is a much smoother body and look at those tiny stubby antennae there compared with the bee's long antennae but most importantly look at those massive eyes at the front joining together almost um, and that's what gives away the fly those big big eyes now wasps uh, they just look bad don't they wasps they're smooth they've got these bold stripes and the key thing about wasps is they've got this incredibly narrow waist um so narrow that at times they look like they're two separate things they're just quite incredible um and they there's the waist is so narrow they can only uh, eat liquid the adults can only eat liquid they can't eat solid food because their gut is too small too narrow to get from one the thorax to the abdomen which I, which I didn't know so there's there we are that's a bee and that's a wasp so that gives you some clues about which it is um so bumblebees are a good place to start particularly because there is an excellent website, the Bum Bumblebee Conservation Trust, which has some very good little resources. And if you're interested in bumblebees, I thoroughly recommend A Sting in the Tail by Dave Goulson, um, who actually founded the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. And it's a wonderful introduction to bees, which really got me interested in them. So here's a couple of bees for you uh, to enjoy. This is the early bumblebee. Now the early bumblebee, um, is a good one for right now because they're just starting to emerge. They're a bit late this year, um, but they're one of the earliest nesting bumblebees, hence the name. And they're the, the workers, uh, you'll see them um, buzzing around now. And you'll see a few males that this year's new brood of males coming out as well. So they're wonderfully fluffy, the males, but both the males and females have this sort of gorgeous uh, color arrangement with white tip of the tail and then that lovely tawny orangey brown and black then yellow and then black again really gorgeous little things uh, very subtle but very very beautiful and the thing about these is that they're very small so you need to be on the lookout for something that's small and you could easily write it off and say that's a fly uh, but just look carefully um, for these because they're much smaller than these big bumbling uh, buff tail bees that we see crashing about in early spring these are little um but very very uh, um very very beautiful um so the next one is possibly my favorite possibly one of my favorite of all the animals i've got to know this year the hairy footed flower bee um it's the anthrophora plumipes um so this is a solitary bee this isn't a bumblebee so they don't have communal nests they don't have social structures there's no workers it's either males or females they appear very early. So even even uh, end of February, these uh, little ones were buzzing around in our in our garden. Um, and they are really I think they're just really beautiful. This is a male um, with this sort of tawny, uh, yellowy, gingery, fluffy uh, body. And look at his sticking out his middle uh, leg, which is important because his middle leg is covered with these uh, great sort of long hairs. And it's slightly mysterious why he has these very hairy legs, but he seems to caress the female over the head while uh, they're mating. Um, so why that's <laughs> particularly important for this particular bee, and why it's an evolutionary advantage to have those hairs, I don't. I haven't been able to find out. And if anyone knows, I'd be delighted to hear. So that's the hairy-footed flower bee. Early, early, very early. Looks like a bumblebee, but it isn't, and it has this hovering, darting flight. Um, very characteristic. And here, so I couldn't resist showing the female as well, um, just to show her lovely orangey hind legs covered with these thick hairs, which are known as the pollen baskets. So only the females collect pollen. You know if a, a bee is a female because it's got pollen baskets because the females will feed the young. So they'll put, it'll collect pollen um, to put in the holes where the, where the larvae will be, will be um, laid. So the eggs will be laid. Um, so wonderful um, animals. So um, we need to move on a little bit. Hoverflies. So we already talked about flies. There are thousands of flies, but hoverflies are a good place to start. And if you're interested in hoverflies, this is a great book, this. And it's a great book because in the centre of it, it has three pages 
where the authors have got photographs of the most commonly photographed hoverflies they found on social media. So basically, it's the hoverflies that you're going to see um, as a beginner. And every time I see a new hoverfly, I go to those three pages in the middle of the book and I always find my hoverfly there because at the moment I'm only picking the common ones. So that is a really clever little feature of this book, but it's a very nicely written, easily written book with beautiful photographs. Um, so that this hoverfly here is the commonest. It's Episurfus baltiatus or the uh, marmalade fly. Many of you may, may see these. We will probably all see these without knowing what they're called. Um, and this one is the second commonest, Hilophilus pendulus, or the football hoverfly. Uh, I'm not sure if it's called that because it's good at football or, or whether it's got it's the stripiness of, of the thorax. Um, so this one is very common uh, in the woods, or it was last year, although I've not seen one this year, um, but it's the second most frequently photographed hoverfly. So if you get to groups with those two, um, you'll be, uh, you'll be on, well on the way. So ladybirds next. You'll see I'm jumping around and I'm missing vast groups of animals, but I can't do them all justice in a short tour like this. Ladybirds, 46 ladybirds, but only um, 26 are conspicuous. The rest are inconspicuous, which basically means <laughs> they're invisible as far as I can see, because uh, I've never seen one. Um, and the thing about ladybirds is they're a lot smaller than you think. Um, so check as you're walking along, all those specks on nettles and ivy and brambles and look carefully at the pattern on the pronotum which is the, uh, the, the the band just behind the head and there's a wonderful field studies council guide and Helen Roy and Peter Brown who are the sort of nation's ladybird experts have these fantastic um, videos on YouTube um, and I checked one out before I recommended it and I've got a uh, uh, and Helen Roy started off by saying, welcome to an hour of ladybird excitement. So what more can you want if you've got a wet spring afternoon? Watch one of those videos and get to grips with your ladybirds. Um, so here's a couple of uh, Martha's pictures again. And the larvae are fun as well. So uh, they're really wonderful looking creatures. And if you want to get your eye in later on in the summer, you'll see lots and lots of these ladybird larvae. And the Field Studies Council do um, an e equally good guide to the larvae as well. So, um, you know, for five pounds you can, or 10 pounds, you can get a couple of these guides, which will give you hours of fun spotting ladybirds. They're a nice group to look at. So the fungi, we're moving on now, skipping through all the other insects. The fungi are very difficult, aren't they? Because there's loads of them. And the fruiting bodies, the mushrooms, if you like, are only there for sometimes a day and then they're gone. So they're transient and most of them only occur in the autumn and they're hugely variable and loads of them are tiny and brown or just look like a patch of mold. So fungi are difficult. They're interesting, but they're difficult. And but there are some that are not difficult when you find them. So these I found on the edge of the path, collared earth stars, wonderful, beautiful things. Um, so keep your eyes open after a bit of rain in the autumn and you might find these uh, treasures like this. Um, and this is a good book, Fascinated by Fungi by P Pat O'Reilly, and there's an accompanying website. But I would have to say, an advocate as I am for self-learning, I feel there's, you know, having been on a fungi course uh, with the Field Studies Council, I think there's no substitute for learning from an expert in the field with fungi because they are tricky. But there are some you can identify. This one, the candle snuff, we've probably all seen these, and it uh, feeds on dead wood after the dead wood's been softened by honey fungus and sulfur tuft mushrooms. And after it's finished, the uh, insects can then mop up the rest of the dead wood. And according to uh, people who like eating uh, fungi, it's too small and tough to eat. Uh, it's surprising anyone ever tried, isn't it really? But anyway, don't try because apparently it's too small and tough. <laughs> it doesn't look like it'd be very tasty, does it? Um, so if I move on, lastly, to humans. So I thought I'd show you a, 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 a few quotes. And these are genuine quotes I heard as I was walking along uh, the trail from people using the trail uh, just for a bit of um, a bit of amusement. Uh, so this first one of this chap going to his mates. Yeah, he gets up at seven 
puts his martial stacks on the trampoline and turns it up full volume. I didn't hear the rest of it, but that was the story. And then there's the, the dog lover. So I was chatting to these this couple who had this sort of uh, massive dog, which had a sort of um, luminous jacket on for some reason. And uh, they were talking to me about, well, what are you looking at? Oh, Red Wings. And this dog suddenly um, you know, leapt up and thumped me uh, in the groin. And <laughs> it was quite a shock, I have to say. And um, so then it was just, no, no, stop it, stop it, Molly, no. Uh, and you have all that for about five minutes. So, you know, if you want to go bird watching, uh, get your dog under control, really. Uh, so those are the dog lovers. Uh, th this one was my favourite, the romantic. So there's this uh, thin looking chap with a sort of wispy beard <laughs> and his girlfriend uh, walking along uh, the wood. And, and he was going, he was pontificating away and he was saying, yeah, some people are sex addicts. I identify myself as a romance addict. And the expression on his girlfriend's face was something to see. It was just uh, just fantastic. It was almost better than the uh, Collard Earth stars. <laughs> well, not, not quite, but... Um, and I couldn't resist putting this one in, uh, which shows you, despite all this talk about connection with nature, it shows you how some urban people are completely disconnected from nature and really haven't a clue. So this is from the East Dulwich Neighbourhood Forum, which is a, a treasure of <laughs> idiotic delights. And this is the hunter gatherer. Um, hey, guys, does anyone know where I can forage for fennel in East Dulwich? I just love that. I mean, you know, it's fantastic, isn't it? Um, so. The ideas that people get anyway let's but there are some optimistic stories so as i was uh, peering at something on a leaf um this young woman uh, came up to me and said are you an entomologist i want to be an entomologist and i was very flattered by that someone thought i was an entomologist and i could barely identify three hoverflies um but um so i was very flattered about that but i was also delighted that someone else was interested in nature and i really hope that person does end up becoming an entomologist because we desperately desperately need more people who know and care about insects so the budding naturalists are rare but hopefully increasing so just to a couple of slides to finish up how did we do well it wasn't really about the numbers was it but we got 293 species in fact there's two more i need to add for my walk this afternoon um, so this 295 i was hoping to get up to 300 this afternoon but we didn't quite get there 295 anyway um so and there's a little breakdown and a lot of them of course are the invertebrates that's the point isn't it um so to get this number up we need to start looking at moths and um, invertebrates in a lot more detail um and i submit monthly lists to the hornerman if anyone's interested i do a bi-monthly blog for the hornerman about the nature trail and all this uh, has given me more confidence uh, to log more records and do more surveys. So I've registered on the Bumblebee Conservation Trust Bee Walk, um, and I also do surveys for the um, Butterfly Conservation, BTO, National Ladybird Survey. There's so much you can do that doesn't actually require a massive amount of expertise uh, once you've got some of the basics. And I've also just become more aware of wildlife near to me. So I don't pull up so many weeds in my little garden. The hairy bitter cress gets a reprieve unless my wife picks it for the guinea pigs, which sometimes happens. Um, I've made a bee hotel. Um, no guests yet, but we'll see. And a stag beetle log pile, perhaps a bit optimistic, but we shall see. Um, and so what have I learned? This is the last slide. I've, I've learned that identifying a species, identifying something, knowing its name is important. When we get to know somebody, a person, the first thing we ask is what your name, what's your name, isn't it? We don't describe people by what they look like. We use their name and we should do that for the species that we see as well. Identifying a species is important. It's not just a scientific game. It's important. And it's a door because it's a door too to greater understanding of that being, isn't it? And also enables you to have compassion for it and enables you to have the knowledge to support uh, that species uh, when people want to do things like chop down woods or build motorways or whatever it might be. And it's also made me uh, appreciate that the living things just on the pavement outside on the main road on that South Circular are you know, as fascinating as those I've seen anywhere in, in Britain and even in the world. I mean, even being able to identify a hairy bittercress or a, you know, a shepherd's purse is, has been quite 
exciting for me and to see this the structure of their seeds and the insects that feed on them while the the, the uh, you know the bmw's roar past it, it, it's quite amazing isn't it how resilient some of our nature is um, and the third thing I've learned is be generous about what you know, even if it's not very much. So when you're out for a walk and you see a bird you can identify, um, just, you know, maybe spend a bit of time talking to people because actually most people love to be shown a Saxon wasp or a collared earth star or even possibly to learn what a swift is. Um, so that's the end. Um, good luck and happy hunting. And I don't mean... <laughs> hunting in terms of getting your guns out leave your guns at home and go and have a look um and um there's a few thanks there but i won't read them out uh, but a lot of people have, have, have helped me in all this so, so thanks to all of them and at the end of the slides there are some resources so if people want to um use those perhaps tess will be able to sort of circulate those on, a, on an email or something but i'll, I'll leave it there um for now and i'm happy to have got a few minutes i hope to take any questions thank you thank you dan that was really inspirational what a lovely talk um you've definitely you know i i feel like i need to get out now and start seeing what's what's around in my local patch um yeah really lovely talk we've got some we've got some questions so we've got a couple of minutes so i'll, I'll hand them over um dan do you ever use any identification apps at all this is from fiona yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I do. I, the, the Woodland Trust One Trees is very good, uh, mainly for beginners, but I, found, I still find it very useful. In fact, I used it today to uh, identify a home oak in the, in the wood that I hadn't seen before. So I used that one. The um, Bumblebee Conservation Trust, there's a couple they do on bees, which again um, are, are good. So I, I use those. Um, and yeah, so those are the ones I use. I mean, there are numerous, numerous others, aren't there? I mean, I, I suppose I'm a bit old fashioned and I quite like a book, um, but everyone's different, aren't they? And there are loads of good apps out there and the apps are increasing in quality. They're no longer replicating what you can get in a, in a field guide. I mean, the, the Woodland Trust is a good example because it works like a key and you click on the color of the bark and the size of the leaves and it takes you quite nicely to what the tree might be. So um, yeah, there's some good apps out there. Um, have a look. Great. Thank you. Um, this is from Char Power. Um, Dan, when are you starting tours? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have a little camp up at the end. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll work it. Maybe one day. One yeah. day. I think you've got some you've got some fans. Um, no. so next question is from Jenny. Um have you been um, writing and illustrating your diary as you did back in the 1970s? That is a really good question. And the answer to that is yes, but it is in a real uh, scrappy way. It's nowhere near as uh, <laughs> you told them. So there's lots of scribbles on bits of paper and notebooks. But actually, um, what I've thought I will do is really make an effort to get it into some sort of order. And I might be asking Martha, who is a much better artist than I am, at helping me with some of the illustrations. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a great idea. And, um, uh, and it, it's, um, you know, as with Edith Holden, it's not about, you know, uh, trying to, uh, it's about you doing it for yourself, aren't you? Because it's such a, it's such a, um, it really reinforces the wonderful things that you've seen. So yes, I'm gonna write it up, but not yeah. immediately. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that, that's a lovely, I think that's a nice end. It's, it's now five o'clock. Um, so thank you for answering these questions. Thank you for your lovely talk. Um, thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today on the first day of the Urban Tree Festival. Um, I'm going to pop in our website into the chat. So please do check out our other events. Um, I'll also thank you to um, say thank you to everyone who donated towards this talk. I'll also, um, if you fancy um, donating to the festival, we'd really appreciate it. Um, so I'll pop a link in there as well. And and um, what I'll do, Dan, thank you for those resources. I will send everyone an email with um, a list of those resources. So expect an email from me um, uh, later today with, with, with that list. Good, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much to everyone. And um, yes, hope to see you at some of our other events um, throughout the, the week. And um, yeah, brilliant. Have a lovely rest of your Saturday. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy yourselves. Get out there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dan. Speak to you soon. Bye bye. Thank you.